I'm Richard Sandler, and I am a uh, street photographer. I'm a photographer. I shoot pictures on the street, and I am a saxophonist every day of my life. That's it. My daughter-in-law set me up on Facebook, and I started posting pictures. And to my uh, surprise, I uh, started to see that uh, it was a very interesting network of people uh, uh, all over the world who were doing work. And for that reason, that made this, um, this way of life, you know, as a maker of pictures, more interconnected. Uh, although strangely vacant because, you know, we're talking here by virtue of burning fossil fuels to create the uh, electricity necessary for making this endeavor happen so that the worldwide problems that we seek to address possibly as image makers and communicators and people with a heart and a mind that, that want to be living more kindly, perhaps. At least that's how I see the internet, always have. Uh, so I'm very in favor of it and I, I, I'm very happy for it and just for the numbers and the diversity of seeing that's out there. Of course, there's way too much if you, you can get subsumed by it, you, you have to be careful, it's very addictive, but it is, you know, if we, if we are, if there is no other, in other words, if we're all connected on some level already, I think the internet has been a very uh, uh, interesting corroboration of that fact, showing really the wonderful uniqueness of us all. I started out with these questions in mind as a photographer on the street to, you know, kind of ask questions about the society that we all share. And if we are not other to each other, really, fundamentally, then we have a right, in a sense, to ask each other questions because it's just like asking yourself. You know, it's like a Bob Dylan line, you know, there's ain't no, ain't no use in talking to me. I'm just like you. It's the same as talking to yourself. It's a great line. I butchered it terribly. So, so that's been a continuation. And then I got into Instagram and that clearly upped the level of that game tre tremendously because now it wasn't people talking about what they had for lunch anymore. When that was all gone, I have to wade through any of that. And it was just about work. So Instagram is the thing, at least right now. I felt that uh, it was wrong that we should live this way, that there should be rich people living at the expense of poor people. So I, my response to that was trying to make, you know, compassionate type photographs that saw the world through the personal, you know, sleeping on the street's eyes. If I could do that, I can't climb in to inside that experience, but at least I can hold it up in front of your face. And, you know, then you look at it, perhaps you have a compassionate response to it too. Um, uh, perhaps not. So, but I was doing, I, in that I am only doing what I can do to present the, uh, the truths of the, the actual way we're living uh, compared to the stories that we tell ourselves. So the disconnect between you know, the American dream and the American reality uh, is, is uh, very different. This is what Robert Frank photographed when he got in his car in 1950, uh, 
was it nine? Uh, yeah, I think 59. And drove across the country, uh, a Swiss guy showing America what it really looked like. And he was reviled for what he showed. But if you dig, if you dig deeper from there, you start to ask structural questions that are asking, well, why do we live this way? How did that happen? I looked at Robert's work, particularly when I first started photography in 1977 in Boston. That's where I started. Uh, and um, yeah, it really blew my mind and, 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 and it immediately spoke to me. And I saw the world he wanted us to see. And I totally agreed with the vision. And, and ultimately, it's not just about art at all, except he, the, the package that he put this truth in was wrapped in formal beauty so that the form of the picture itself was like the, uh, uh, like the sticky part of the Venus flytrap, you know, that, that like had you in, you know, caught, caught you, the beauty of the, the form, the formal beauty of the work caught you. And then once you were caught, you had to look because you had to feel the elegance of that form, but it had a bitter pill. And that's what is what we do, I think, as photographers, is to present a package, a formal packaging to an idea or a feeling or a thought or a question or such and have it get in. So, you know, you trick people by making it formally beautiful, uh, but that's, that's the door that's unguarded. People may have an, an immediate response to the uh, subject matter of a photograph. They say a homeless person and they say, ouch, that hurts, I'm gone. But if you, if you make that photograph in such a way that it's formally undeniably beautiful or or gets in through an unguarded door somehow, you know, it's like good music. Uh, good photography is like good music in that sense. You know, if it's beautiful enough, it gets in no matter what. You can spit it out if you want, but it, got, it does get in if it's packaged beautifully. Uh, and that's what he did. That's what Gary Winogrand did. I started when I was 31, yes. He came my third career. I did immediately pretty much start making my living doing photojournalism for newspapers and magazines in Boston and then in New York. And I knew I wanted to do that. I had done two careers, as I said previously, successfully. And um, I felt like I knew the methodology of, you know, from the other two, I, I'd learned a way to become good at something by applying myself that I thought I had some aptitude for. I taught a lot uh, for a number of years, and, and I found that that was very common, that photography was something that people could actually learn pretty easily, pretty quickly. Um, and I did learn it easily and quickly and had great fortune. And, um, but, but still, I, I felt that I, I understood a little bit about um, starting something new. I, I didn't feel, I mean, I felt humbled by how difficult it was to make a good picture immediately. It's so easy to press the button and so hard to make a good one, you know, cause it's got its own aesthetics and it's, I mean, of course it's different for every person and it's so unique and it's mind blowing when you think about what it is, you know, it's the freezing of an instant. We can't do that with our eyes. We need a camera to show us what an instant looks it's like freeze, frozen, I mean. I felt like it was a matter of a week. Um, I made one picture that completely blew my mind. And, and then another one a couple of weeks later. And I was hooked. And, and, and one of them is, the, is in my book, um, The Eyes of the City. It, it, and I made that picture. I guess it was, I don't know, maybe five or six or eight rolls into shooting. 
I had a very fortunate beginning because I had a lot of help from a extended community of helping people. Um, and uh, it was a, a commune and people lived very inexpensively uh, in the home of a, a very important uh, psycho Harvard psychologist uh, and uh, who, who with his wife uh, were Quakers and, and very kindly people and they raised five kids in their, in their house and they all moved out because they grew up. And then they took people in to live for $30 a, a month rent and $15 a week each person for food. We sat around every night at a huge dinner table and talked about we did that, what we did that day. I was given a Leica by the, the woman who owned the house. She gave me her Leica, she didn't want it. Anyway, and that in, the, in a nutshell, is the mindset that I had and grown into at age 31. So when I hit the streets, living in a house where I only had to pay $30 a month rent, it was not hard to make $30. Um, I was given this incredible opportunity to be who you want to be type of thing by older people who were wiser than me and were saying, okay, We'll, we'll take you under our wing. It was a dark room in the basement. The guy living down the hall from me was a professional photographer. He taught me things. Everybody I knew was into photography. It's a very, very visual scene of, uh, you know, very cool people involved in. And meeting Winogrand was absolutely the cherry on the cake. He was really a very, very cool human being. He was a a very smart guy and he was very communicative. He really wanted to help people out and he was true to himself at every turn, a real truth teller and uh, just a beautiful guy. So I had this great weekend with him and I basically learned everything that I needed to learn about well, I, I knew technically how to operate the camera fairly well at that point. I was three months into it. But what I watched and saw was how he held himself, how he moved like a, like a dancer and how he made himself invisible. He made himself nobody. He became nobody. He became invisible just by being, you know, like gestures that we recognize as, you know, the animals that we are animal type movements that were confusing or possibly off-putting or something. You know, he just he just got into this weird space that 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 was unique to him and what he had to do. And so I I saw I saw how he did it. He gave that away. He he gave everything away. He was so generous. But he wouldn't say to digress a little, but it's not really a digression, but he wouldn't say ever what made a picture work. So in this workshop, two people got kicked out because they kept giving Winogrand, Winogrand a hard time because he wouldn't answer their questions, which were, well, what makes a picture good? You know, and he, he said, if I start talking that way, then I might, um, I might offend the muse that allows this magic to happen, something like that. So when he would critique our pictures, so we, this was a Thursday night, was a lecture. Friday went out, we went out and shot as a group. There was like five of us plus Winogrand. I mean, after the two got kicked out, they got kicked out after the first day. So it went from seven to five. And then, so it, the, we went out and shot and then went home that night and developed our film, made contact sheets and made prints and brought them in the next day at one o'clock or two o'clock uh, in, the, in the afternoon. And the second day would begin and we'd put the pictures up on the wall. So we all did that. And Winogrand um, uh, was now gonna critique them. So he, he gets up uh, and he starts looking at them 
and he walks by pictures and he doesn't say a word, not, not a word. And then he comes upon a picture that I suppose he likes and he, he knocks it and then just keeps walking and then goes, you know, and that, that was his critique. If he liked a picture, he would knock it with his, with his middle finger, you know? No, he wouldn't say anything. He, he, just, he talked about the frame. He talked about the dialogue between form and content. And the good pictures, he said, were the ones where um, the form was threatening to overwhelm the content, the architecture of the frame, the shape of the frame, the, what I was talking about earlier, you know, the packaging of it, the, the, you know, the, the unmistakable um, beauty of, of a good frame that's, you know, the three-dimensional world put in two dimensions. Because so, photogra photographs are magical objects. You know, they, they, they show the three-dimensional world in two dimensions. And in this case, in, it was black and white. The world's not black and white. So, you know, a photograph is an entirely different thing than reality. It looks like reality. So it's, it's really gotcha. It's a, that's why we all love it so much. One of the reasons. But um, what, what, what I'm getting at is that uh, he, he was very eloquent about that that the picture had to have energy so the ones that he hit with his with his finger had energy and and he didn't want to describe it because he didn't want to offend the muse that that brings that energy in and it's unique because in every picture it's unique it happens in a unique way every picture is unique i mean yeah you can try to copy somebody else's work or something um which is actually a, a reasonable thing to do in first starting out. In fact, that's how I first started. A part of my incredibly good, good luck in becoming a photographer in 1977 was that I was allowed to sit in on a, um, a class being taught at Harvard, a photography class being taught at Harvard, uh, uh, I live, you know, very near the school. Uh, by uh, a great uh, critic uh, of photography, writer on photography named Ben Lifson, L-I-F-S-O-N. And he, at the time, he was the critic, the photography critic for the Village Voice in New York City. The Voice had a photo critic, and it was him. And he was very eloquent, and he knew the history of photography backwards and forwards. Anyway, he, he allowed me to sit in on his class that semester. And uh, that was the first time I ever heard the names, you know, Robert Frank and Gary Winogrand and Walker Evans and, and uh, Car uh, Cartier-Bresson and Brassai, you know, and Man Ray, you know, <laughs> Ansel Adams. <laughs> His assignments were to the students, because it was a shooting class too, was look at the work of Dion Arbus, and make that picture, okay? Copy it, make that picture, find that person, find that energy, locate that energy and make that picture. Look at the work of Gary Winogrand, look at the work of Lee Friedlander, look, you know, and on and on and on. And each week it would be just, you know, one photographer. And, and his idea was that if you walk that walk and, and try to see that way, it, it would be, I think the way he described it was, it, it was like playing a composition that already existed. It was like playing Bach or playing Beethoven, but playing it your way, because it's still you. It's, it's you. So I thought that was a brilliant, uh, a brilliant lesson uh, for people to walk the walk of, of, of different people whose work you admired and let yourself go. You know, just, I want to make that picture. I'm looking for that picture today. So you have a focus. So, but of course, inevitably, you don't make their picture, you make your picture. But, and, and so it's the feeling ultimately is what you're, what you're finding. It, it leads you through form to content and, and, to, and to an emotion. Uh, photographs are only good if they, if they, I think, if they, have both that formal beauty as well as emotion. And 
or, or just that they ask questions, that they pose questions, uh, more questions than they um, uh, resolve. And the other thing about being out there a lot is that accidents happen, so-called accidents. Some people would say they're not accidents, but they're clearly accidents that happen because you're photographing, if you're a street photographer, you're photo photographing a, wor a world in flux, uh, really in flux. Of course, trees are in flux, the leaves are in flux, whatever. Um, but uh, people are moving on the street and it's very difficult to be able to see a stopped moment. You're, 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 the, the degree to which you get good at photography is the degree to which you see like a camera sees which is with monocular vision, not binocular vision. You know, you're, you're, the camera sees through one eye, but you're seeing the world through two. You're never taking the picture you see. You're always taking the picture the camera sees. So if you learn to see, that's the, you know, the first big lesson is see the way a camera sees with one eye. And of course you do compose with one eye. So, so, but before you put the camera up to your eye, you're seeing with two, and then you put the, the, put the camera up to your eye, and now you're seeing with one eye. Now you're seeing the world with one eye, and that's how a camera sees. So it's important to, uh, you know, in, in your own self-education, for me it was self-education, to constantly make reference between what the camera is seeing and what I'm seeing the moment before I put it to my eye. It's different, it's different. And the three dimensional world is put in two dimensions also. And that's something that's also very hard to pre-visualize. What happens on a photograph is always that. So the three dimensional world is, is turned into two dimensionals. And, and so that's another part of it that is, so important you look at the work of like lee friedlander particularly and he really really can play with that of course it's a function of depth of field to a large extent it is but only cameras see with depth of field our eyes don't see with depth of field but a lens does so that we can see the world we can see your your eyes in perfect focus and the door frame in the back in perfect focus at f16 but not at f2 so you have this other whole different realm of control and then there's the you know the, the loosey-goosey as, aspect of time of uh, time that stops you know reality's flow and time that and time that elongates it so taking a picture at a a quarter of a second you know with the flash for instance and you see, you know, the frozen image of the flash, but superimposed upon that is the blur of the quarter second exposure that the flash is happening within. See, the best pictures very often are made on the edges. It's the edges of the frame, you know, the very top. This is where the world is cut off. You know, it's, you're putting a frame around the world and the edges are so important. The, and, and I, you know, started shooting for the edges from the beginning. The reason why I called my book The Eyes of the City was because you see a lot of eyes in these pictures. I, I, I'm not saying that I'm the eyes of the city, but I am, you know, in my own little way. There are many eyes of the city. I'm hardly the only one, but it's people's eyes. I'm looking all the time, people are looking all the time, and um, they're looking at me, and sometimes it really works. Sometimes it really works because it's that unguarded moment very often that shows the sweetness or the, the suffering, uh, the pathos, whatever, on, on their face. And that to me makes, that, that, that's an ingredient for an important picture because this is something that human beings share and uh, it's, a, it's a way of communication, empathy, compassion. Um, and I feel strongly about that 
particularly now in history, maybe not in the earlier years of photography's history. I, I, I do want the work that I make to have some sort of a, uh, a ripple effect of, of communication and uh, possibly uh, uh, kindness and, and, and um, demythologizing the differences between us and um, presenting the similarities. So grateful for it because it is nice to look back and see history now. You know, I'm doing it 43 or 44 years now, and uh, it is it is interesting to s trace just that history in photographs and to see what we looked like, what we acted like. Uh, there, there's hints and guesses there. There is information there. And so it is a continuity of a story that I would like to see have a, a you know, a happier, a kinder uh, a relationship with. One could even imagine a world where you wouldn't need photography. And that world existed before photography. Cave paintings, right? So there was always some but that, but that was seems so seems so benign. We won't know. We'll never know what the meaning of them particularly were. But it didn't seem like it was about anything other than representation. And there's a whole school of photography that's like that. That Winogrand was famous for saying, "There's nothing." I think he was quoting Marcel Proust. I'm not sure of that though. Saying, uh, uh, "There's nothing more mysterious than a." Uh, a uh, uh, a fact um, told perfectly. There's nothing more mysterious than a fact well seen. So in in pictures that would mean just the thing itself, but seen so well, you know, you find just the exact right place to stand. Sort of like Aceh's work. You know, the, it was so brilliant at such an early time in photography to be able to see the way he saw. I think uh, he, he was, uh, his work still stands out as being modern. Um, I did get into video uh, and I felt great about what I had done in still photography. And I wanted to parlay that feeling into something else because I wanted to do other things in life. I didn't want to just be a still photographer. They all started in 1992 uh, with with video, and then uh, in 1999 with uh, film, Super 8, 16, and 35 millimeter film. It's like I walked into Times Square, and most people saw one thing, but I saw something else completely. And and after a while, they started finding me people that had things that they wanted to talk about knew there was this guy on the street with a camera and that he wanted you to talk about whatever you wanted to say. That, that, would, that, that was shot over almost an eight year period. So that's for me, the only way to make good work is that it takes a long time because then it kind of makes itself. You, that'll never happen to you in the first week of shooting in Times Square that or you know, or you, you, you're less likely. But word got out, and also, I got out. You know, my inner projection of what I wanted, which was for people to talk to me. I was wearing that somehow in my body, in my in my stance, or I was attracting people. I was attracting people and I wanted to do that. And it happened. And um, so that uh, the movie kind of made itself in a way, the documentary made itself. People, it was, it was truly magical. I, I didn't really have much of an agenda in, in shooting that, uh, except that I wanted to speak to people about religion and, and God and such. But there's also a lot of talk that goes beyond religion. It was 
it was the function of Times Square always was the place where people could speak their mind. That was the place where you went to blow off some steam, you know, and uh, it was always this you know, joyful, uh, you know, hodgepodge of all human desires and needs and questions. It was truly democracy, I think, in action. Uh, there, there are a absolutely aspects of it that were, you know, terrible, of course, like always in life. But uh, there was this this sense that you could speak your mind there, that you could do anything there. And it was a playland for adults. Anyway, the handwriting was on the wall that Times Square was going to change and it was going to turn into like this corporate landscape. And uh, New York was getting lots of money and people with money were moving in and the yuppie invasion happened and the tech first tech explosion and Wall Street money and greed was good with Reagan in 84. You know, all this pot of, of uh, capitalism started cooking up real big. And that meant that Times Square's days were numbered. So I didn't know that when I started in 92, but I figured it was gonna happen. I, 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 guess, I guessed it would happen pretty soon because it was starting to really be run down. And, um, and, and at that point, it was probably, I think it was the most dangerous few blocks in the world. Uh, in the center of Times Square, you were more likely to get robbed than in any other place on planet Earth, I believe, for a couple of years. So it was not without good reason that the city wanted to clean up Times Square because it's people shouldn't have to fear for their personal safety. You know, a secretary working at, at the New York Times and going home to the subway and walking out and getting robbed, that, that's, not a, that's not a good city. You don't want that city. You know, that's, that's too much. What I'm doing now is I'm trying to uh, find a publisher for her second book of still photographs. I've spent the last five years here uh, going through my whole entire... Um, uh, uh, my whole entire uh, archive and uh, have come up with a lot of pictures. A lot of the ones you've seen on my Instagram page, uh, many, if not most of the ones uh, in the last uh, th three or four years on that platform are new uh, to me. I had never printed them before. I had rejected them before, or I had simply overlooked them for various reasons, which I could get into if you want to, but um, nonetheless, they were overlooked and now they're no longer overlooked. And I've got, a, I think, a really strong second book. I, I think it's a matter of uh, people of goodwill, uh, having uh, more and more people of goodwill. It's not, it's not one photograph that's gonna do it, but you know, uh, thousands of photographs that show humanity may open up a, a, a heart a, a little bit or open up a mind you know a little bit and that's a wonderful thing and if it doesn't happen you still don't know i mean the seed could be planted or it comes out in a dream and you you have a dream about it and it's, anyway it's input it's 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 taking the narrative in hand and questioning it um uh and and i and i think it's it's right to do that just simply because these cultures that we live in are a function of, you know, a, a, um, a lot of suffering and that hurts. You know, other, another person's suffering hurts you. you know? So uh, we, we have that responsibility to uh, at least pose these questions and not walk by them.